um, Constantine Matviev has been very patient waiting and we'll move on to him. Um, oh. Thanks for waiting, Constantine. Um, Constantine Matviev is a professor in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering at Washington State University. In his presentation titled Recent Hydrofoil Studies at Washington State University, he gives an overview of some recent hydrofoil projects conducted by his research group on advanced marine vehicles there. The first is on air ventilation of surface piercing hydrofoils and ways of mitigating that phenomenon. He describes validation studies of the computational approach for simulation um, of air ventilated hydrofoils using experimental data from well-controlled experiments. They showed that air ventilation in high lift regimes could be suppressed by small fences on the hydrofoil surface. His second project is on modeling flexible composite hydrofoils using coupled fluid and solid solvers uh, they investigated the effects of fiber orientation on the hydrodynamic and structural characteristics of hydrofoils. His last project that he'll discuss concerns development of small scale autonomous hydrofoil boats. Konstantin Matviev grew up in Gorky, Russia, in a family of designers of advanced marine vehicles, including hydrofoils, his father being a famous designer himself. He obtained bachelor's and bachelor's master's degrees and applied physics from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, and then a PhD in mechanical engineering from Caltech. His main research interests at Washington State University include advanced marine vehicles, computational marine hydrodynamics, fluid structure interactions, dynamics, autonomy, and renewable energy systems. Besides his university teaching and research, he consults with industry, and he is also notably co-author of a major technical handbook on small water plane area ships, along with Victor Dubrovsky, and I remember very well when that came out, 12 or 15 years ago, I think. So um, thank you, Constantine, and go ahead. So Bill, we will start uh, Constantine's uh, video, correct? Yes. Hello, my name is Konstantin Matviev. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering at Washington State University. And today I will talk about, about some of my recent hydrofoil projects. I'm sitting now at, in Eastern Washington, right? So our county produces a lot of wheat and lentil. However, I, I'm still able to do projects on advanced marine vehicles. So my work is supported by Department of Defense, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, and the industry. So today I will briefly talk about a few recent hydrofoil projects. So we'll start with uh, air ventilation phenomena on high lift hydrofoils. So if uh, we have a surface piercing hydrofoil, then uh, low pressure zone is created on the upper side, so air can propagate from atmosphere, reduce lifting capabilities of this hydrofoil. So this is example of computational fluid dynamic simulation. So you can see that a large fraction of the suction side is ventilated with air and lift coefficient on the clean foil is about 0.6 in this condition. So if, you put, if we put fences on the hydrofoil, so we can limit propagation of right, air from the atmosphere along the foil and also restrict the jet on the other side. So this helps raising the lift coefficient about twice while improving lift to drag ratio about 50%. Right, so in the past, those fences were often researched using experiment, experiments, but now with availability of computational fluid dynamics tools, so we can do it uh, faster at lower cost. However, the question arises whether those predictions are correct. And for this purpose, we do uh, validation studies. So here we looked at the vertical hydrofoil uh, that 
was tested in the towing tank, so they changed attack angle, the flow angles, the flow condition uh, was uh, corresponded to weighted surface. At high attack angles, the suction side was ventilated. So test data for lift, drag, and moment coefficients are given by these blue circles, right? So you can notice at 15 degrees attack angle, there are two different states, right? So the upper point corresponds to the wet condition, the lower to the ventilated state. And um, this is known as hysteresis. So each state is possible, but the existence of specific flow condition depends on the history of the system. So using computational fluid dynamic tools, so we were able to replicate right, this flow and achieved very good agreement for all coefficients, lift, drag, and moment, right? And we were even able to predict non-uniqueness of flow states at this 15 degrees attack angle. Therefore, we believe we can trust the computational tools we are using. So the second um, project I will briefly describe is on composite hydrofoils, right? So at the present time, composites are often used for hydrofoils on surfboards and high-performance sailing yachts. Right? So the advantages of composite hydrofoils, they are lighter, easier to service, they have uh, higher strength to weight ratio, right? However, they are more flexible, failure mechanisms may be more complicated. And there is also potential advantage of self-adaptability since by smartly designing the internal structure of the hydrofoil, you can make lift coefficient dependent right on the flow conditions. So this is again an example of simulation using our computational tools. So this gray hydrofoil corresponds to the original state, non-deflected um, structure and the actual hydrofoil at the operational speed will be located closer to the water surface, right? So this blue zone corresponds to the wave hollow and red is basically the spray. All right, so again, in order to uh, be confident in our numerical results, we conducted validation studies. So we used experimental data obtained in well-controlled experiments and water channels, so they used flexible hydrofoil, right, measure it, deflection, twist at the tip, and by doing computational simulations, we were able to obtain results that we could compare with experimental data. Our agreement was, yeah, within 2% of, uh, of test data. So again, we believe we can model the flexible hydrofoils as well. So these simulations are more complex, right? Since hydrofoil can be deflected, uh, this deflection depends on the internal structure. So you need to put mesh inside the hydrofoil and also make numerical mesh outside hydrofoil movable. So operating, say, in unsteady environments such as waves, this hydrofoil will bend, twist, and numerical domain will also deform. So using computational tools, again, we can obtain detailed information about various properties such as pressure coefficient, stresses, right, water surface deformations. So this video shows uh, deflection of flexible hydrofoil in the presence of incident waves. So again, the gray structure here is the original shape of the hydrofoil, but deflected hydrofoil is located on top of that. So you can see how it moves up and down, right? In the presence of incident waves, you can see also how the wave hollow and spray waves are evolving behind the hydrofoil. So one of the characteristics we investigated here is the effect of fiber orientation inside this composite hydrofoil on hydrodynamic properties. So the fiber angle zero corresponds to the fibers going in span-wise direction. So again, we are looking at surface piercing hydrofoils. So this is front view and top view. 
So the positive angles will correspond to the fibers going from the root to the leading edge and negative angles from the root to the trailing edge. All right, so I obtained hydrodynamic characteristics at different fiber orientation. As you can see, twist angle will be negative, right, in case of the fiber angle going towards the leading edge. And that results in the lift reduction. Therefore, this hydrofoil will presumably have more constant lift force in the range of speed, right? So if speed increases, hydrodynamic load increases, right, the foil will twist in the negative direction, lift coefficient will drop, so lift force will change smaller than it would change on the rigid hydrofoil. Okay, so now let's move to experimentation. So we started developing small scale unmanned boats, right? We're interested in testing advanced hydrodynamic concepts, advanced autonomous algorithms, novel sensors, communication modules. So we started, right, with cheap electronics based on Arduino, right, um, using telemetry like laptops on the shore, so we can assign waypoints and this hydrofoil will move in a certain trajectory. So here an example of the uh, small hydrofoil is shown, so it's about two feet long, so it has front and uh, rear foils and outboard motor. So we also put loads, load cell to measure thrust force. Right, so here a couple of examples of video we recorded with those hydrofoils of this monohull with two foils in front and the back. Right, and this is the trimaran, so it has main hull, two small outriggers, triggers, and only one foil in, in front. Right, so the purpose of these specific boats were to develop high-speed platforms so they can move uh, about 25 to 30 feet per second. So again, one of the um, motivations for this project is to develop and test autonomous algorithms. So here a mathematical model is given for a relatively simple case. So we're looking at the hydrofoil moving, uh, pursuing a target, right? So these are dynamics equations, hydrodynamic coefficients, and we're using specific constant bearing method for desired speed of the hydrofoil. So the idea is it would reach moving target and uh, sail with the target's speed. So these are equations we use for rudder and thrust control. Right, so uh, some examples of numerical simulations even on this slide, so the target in the first case is moving along the straight line, so pursuer starts at this point, right, and gradually approaches the target. So relative velocity here, right, goes to zero. So the hydrofoil is able to reach the target and stay with that boat. So in the second case, we are looking at oscillating trajectory of the target. Again, the motions are more complicated, but the hydrofoil is still able to reach the target. All right, so uh, these are our current and recent efforts in hydrofoils. So you can find more information on my website. Thank you very much for attending my presentation and good luck. All right, so sorry about moving up and down the screen a little bit. I didn't realize that turned up on the video as well. <laughs> Who has the first comment or question? I'll ask a question. Um, one of the problems that we've experienced with the American's Cup hydrofoils is the issue of ventilation when we plunge the foil into the water it captures a big bubble of air and then that bleeds off and 
we did not have any way of, of predicting just what that process would be or how to control just how fast that air disappeared. Have you done any work with ventilation of plunging hydrofoils? Not specifically for plunging hydrofoils, but it can be done using computational tools. Yeah. But yeah, we have not investigated that specific case. I'll, I'll ask a, a, a related question, really. I, I try to think when I see some things like this, who would actually use something like that? Have you tried to find companies operating hydrofoils that could benefit from having fences? They don't know they need them, and now you can tell them they do and what the performance benefits might be. Have you tried I, to find users? Yeah, I think fences are known for a long time, for decades they were used on some Russian hydrofoil, mm -hmm. but they did not have means kind of to optimize them, I guess numerically. So they had to experiment and it's their scale effect and it's difficult to modify kind of large scale boats. Yeah, but nowadays with computational tools, we can actually do some optimization so we can run in hundreds of simulations quickly. Are all your fences uh, cover the entire cord of the hydrofoil? Yes, yeah. But again, we just explored a few configurations. Yeah, they cover entire cord on both sides. I and we had two fences, one underwater, one above the water. So one basically prevents ventilation, the other can restricts the water on the, on the pressure side. Yeah. I. Um... Uh, was very interested to see the fences on the Seafly catamaran. They were only about maybe 15, 20% of the cord. And, um, and they worked with a, a, a kind of a different principle. What they did was they shed a vortex. And so the air that came down, the, especially the leading edge, would hit the fence and then get entrained into the vortex and then that trailing vortex would basically drain the air away from the hydrofoil. So they were able to use fences that were much smaller than any that I'd ever seen before and still effectively suppress the ventilation. Mm -hmm. Just to add to the discussion on fences, um, the, the old Suprama boats, uh, they have various different um, fence configurations. There's fences uh, projecting to either side of the rudders. So when you're using the rudder, you don't get ventilation down the rudder and onto the foil, presumably. Um, they've got short fences just in the flap area if you're using flaps on the bow foils, for instance. So mm. the geometries are actually quite different depending on where, where they're trying to uh, control the, the ventilation. And I, I guess those guys back in the, in the 50s and 60s had to very much do trial and error because they did didn't have the, the benefit of the, the CFD codes that uh, Constantine demonstrated. Yeah. So again, our goal is not to develop any kind of practical designs for kind of academic institutions. So we're just trying to see whether computational tools can be used to predict some phenomena. And so we try to validate our numerical results with experimental studies. But whenever there's, yeah, it's if company or agency is interested in some practical configuration. So then we do specific studies. And so I have a couple of grants from Office of Naval Research and now DARPA. So we're doing some specific studies, but I cannot talk about them. Um, roughly how far below the water surface should the fence be? I, mean, I guess obviously, I, I, you know, there's a trade-off here. If it's, yeah. if it's too close to the surface, then then there's a good chance that, of course, it'll be exposed by waves and not effective. But if mm -hmm. it's far down, then you're losing a lot of potentially a lot of the foil to ventilation. Um, do, you, do you have any sort of rules of thumb for roughly how far down the fence should be? Maybe yeah, between I know half and one quart. But again, this is this depends on specific application and if sure. you appear yeah, in waves or you know, in inland water without waves. Right. But again, we can optimize. So our goal again is not to 
develop any practical things, but yeah, if client needs something, so we can do these simulations and the optimization if needed. Yes, Martin, again. So still sticking to the ventilation theme, Constantine, your, your graph showed uh, the, the lift going up on both your experiments and your CFD analysis. So the lift climbed up and then suddenly dropped and then started climbing again after the, the ventilation set in. Um, and you talked about hysteresis, but whoops, something's just happened. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you can still hear me, but uh, yeah, the, sure. the oh, you're, you're putting your screen up, of course. Um, uh, the, as you come back down with, for instance, angle of attack, um, it goes back to the sort of question that Tom was asking, does the ventilation hang on and sort of reduce the lift as you come down so you get a, a complete hysteresis loop? You, you don't sort of tend to show it on the way down again. So I'm just curious about whether your codes would predict that and whether your experiments would have detected that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, in reality, if you gradually reduce attack angle, so at some point, yeah, the ventilation will disappear. So yeah, we have not looked at yeah all attack angles. So our goal was just to be able to predict non-uniqueness at sure. least intermediate angle. But in, yeah, in principle, it's doable. But yeah, it would require more simulations to be run and compared with test results. So there are plenty of test results. So they actually show this complete hysteresis curves. Got so it, got it. Somebody asks us and give us money <laughs> to run this session. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Uh, I'm, I'm interested here. I'm I'm interested that I don't have the money. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> how, how do you trigger going from uh, between whether you get one state or the other state in your mm -hmm. computations? So in our simulations, so we first say started at zero attack angle. So we established flow, then we gradually increased attack angle. So flow stayed wet, like both sides of the hydrofold were wet. Then if you continue increasing attack angle, so, or, so in simulations, you can just sharply turn the hydrofoil say to 30 degrees for, from 15 degrees to 30 degrees. So foil will become ventilated. Right, so if you now you're using small increments, yeah, just going down by maybe a couple of degrees back to 15 degrees. So ventilation will will stay there. Okay, so, so, it, imitates, so it imitates what you do experimentally. So you gradually go either from zero degree, you increase and then you gradually decrease. So in principle, in simulations, we did that hysteresis loop, but yeah, what we focused on, on just these four characteristic points. But that's how we did. So we just changed attack angle. Right, so right. So, so on history so, of the process, so you may have either ventilated or wet stated, right, at the same attack angle. Right. So the so the uh, the so the left hand portion of that curve you had an increasing angle of attack and then for the right hand portion you had decreasing yeah. angle of attack yes uh, yeah that's correct yeah. have you have you tried to um to to you know to define any sort of criteria for ventilation for example my understanding is that there are certain necessary conditions for ventilation to occur. One is, of course, you have to have pressure lower than atmospheric. Um, another is that there must be flow separation. And, yeah. and then there must be, of course, a path from the separated zone to the air. Um, now, I, yeah. I, 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 anecdotally, uh, talking to some moss sailors, they report that um, that water temperature makes a difference in ventilation, and so it, it's obviously a boundary layer phenomenon uh, as yeah. well. Uh, have you tried to define any sort of criteria that defines sort of the boundary between uh, ventilated and non-ventilated flows? that could be used in a design sense? So we have not tried that, but there are experimental papers where 
those transitions are mapped in terms of root number and the attack angle. Right. So for it's basically speed, real right. speed, mm -hmm. attack angle. So they have those curves that demonstrate like boundary between those regimes when you have transitions. Mm -hmm. And they correspond to specific Reynolds numbers. So again, so in principle, yeah, this can be done. And there are papers on, from experimental side where they basically presented the stability boundary. So depending on how fast you go and what's the attack angle, right, for specific Reynolds number and say foil geometry, you can predict what will happen. So there are papers in, I think, Journal of Fluid Mechanics, maybe Journal of Fluids Engineering. Mm -hmm. So you can find PhD thesis. I think it, this work, experimental work was done at University of Michigan. So this thesis should be available online. So they have maps like fruit number versus attack angle and they show stability boundary. So by looking at that, you can predict transition. Have your CFD studies um, given you any insight into the mechanisms behind ventilation? Yeah, so we can observe this phenomenon. So again, we have not studies studied focused on those mechanisms in details, but yeah, you can see sometimes air is propagating along the base of the hydrofoil. Sometimes it starts from the leading edge. Yeah. So again, we were not focused on. Yeah, I just wonder if you had studying these mechanisms. Yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, if you because the, the CFD should be wonderful for actually yeah. digging into the physics of how ventilation starts and. And yeah. So yeah, if somebody gives money like Office of Naval Research or National Science Foundation, <laughs> <laughs> we would do that for sure. But it's very difficult to secure a funding for this type of fundament. This this is fundamental study would be considered fundamental study. And right. Yeah. I, this area is I do consider it to be hundred years old. I think by people in Washington D.C. So they they don't give money much money for this fluid mechanics research. Galen, you started to raise your hand. You're, you're, uh, okay, good. Ask your yes, question. Yes, I do have a question. Um, and I forget if you mentioned it, but just so we have an idea of the appreciation for it, uh, what are like the CPU times or wall clock times that we're thinking, uh, that we're looking at for these brands simulations? I guess like an average so, one. Sorry, day. can you, uh, time, are you asking about computational times? Yeah, wall uh, clock, CPU time. So, yeah, it depends on computer. So usually we use about 40 on the, so we have computer workstation. So it's not super computer, but it's also not a regular computer. In re regular computer you usually have maybe two or four cores. This will about 40 for zero cores. So it takes maybe a couple, uh, two to three days, I think to complete simulation starting from an unsteady simulation. And then we just uh, find the regime. I when couldn't understand that myself, Constantine. So we stop yeah. that. Usually physically it takes maybe about 10 seconds of physical time. You can sometimes use large time step, then you can reduce time. So first you just go approximately close to the, your equilibrium state with large time steps or your simulations won't be accurate in that regime, but once you reach that, you can reduce time step and then just figure out what's the steady state. So this way you can accelerate your simulation, but like entire transient process will not be accurately simulated, but you will get on the equilibrium point. So yeah, basically it's yeah, two, two to three days for one data point on yeah, 40 core machine. Hmm. Was that clear enough, Galen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess a follow up question is um, so for the unsteady part, um, what what are the next steps on like modeling that? <laughs> are you asking about flexible hydrofoils or still disventilated? Uh, so well, the, the transition from fully wetted to fully ventilated. In terms of computational time, so it's kind of, this, yeah, 
couple of days, I guess, to yeah, go between these regimes. Is that, was that the question? About computation? No, no. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm not an entire expert on RANs, but it's my understanding that it's a time average um, approach. And I'm asking about like, um, are there plans? Time to... average in the sense it does not predict turbulent fluctuations, mm -hmm. but you can still capture like uh, macroscopic features of the flow that evolve in time. So it cannot capture, say, I don't know, very fast, small eddies, like microscopic eddies, but it can still capture unsteady evolution of the flow. So in principle, yeah, you can predict, so for, for example, flat, in case of flexible hydrofoil or hydrofoil in waves, so you can resolve how lift force will change in time. So if you use the runs approach. So again, you need to show validation. So if, yeah, you, if you get good agreement with experiment, right, and specific regime, then yeah, it works well. Mm -hmm. So again, okay. my, my philosophy is just yeah, to, to use the simplest method as possible. If you prove that it works for several cases, then yeah, probably within reasonable you know, range around those points, so probably you will get reasonable results. So some people, yeah, in, again, in academia, so they want to use this edges method that are more complicated, like LAS, DS method. So need very fine mesh, then yeah, you have to use either supercomputer. So it will take me several months can, to do the same simulation we can do in one day. Here. So there are more, more accurate hydrodynamic models, but they would require supercomputers if you really want to resolve what happens on, say, millimeter scale or below that. Mm -hmm. Another question or observation? Well, I had uh, just this one question. Bill, it's Ray. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Constantine, where do you think that hydrofoils are going as far as the uh, general design? We were just watching a presentation on submerged hydrofoils, mm -hmm. and uh, you're involved in surface piercing hydrofoils primarily, uh, Russian models, and uh, things like the uh, Seattle Ferry that's coming out now is, uh, has uh, catamaran hulls with a hydrofoil assist in, in the uh, forward portion of the of the uh, of the boat, and then we've seen some presentations where the hydrofoils are aft of the propulsion, aft of the stern. But uh, where do you think uh, the big applications are headed? What's most practical? So for commercial applications, so I think it's yeah driven by demand. So if you so hydrofoils, they kind of optimal in this about maybe hundred ton vessel or so basically if you need to transport passengers without cars then yeah hydrofoils might be the optimal application like uh, yeah one in seattle area for example but again for some military applications so there are advantages for example using flexible hydrofoils since they can also damp motion so they may help you in rough water so again, you have to use composite hydrofoils rather than metal hydrofoils. That's kind of one direction we're trying to pursue and convince you know, these people on the military side that our hydrofoils will actually allow you to move faster in waves since you can damp motion. Basically, we're, instead of using rigid body, so we're trying to go into flexible ones. So it will be like an animal, essentially. So it can adapt itself to operating conditions. And especially with this developments in microcontrollers, electronics. So now, you, yeah, you can make entire hull and foils can movable. So I think if we can make transformable hydrofoils that will adapt for specific, yeah, speeds, sea states, then that will be beneficial because one of the 
drawbacks is that Hydra Falls, they're very good, but only narrow range, operational range. But if you can modify them, adapt to kind of maybe use artificial artificial intelligence, can kind of maybe read waves in front of you, and can make adaptation and provide smooth ride and rough sea then. I think, yeah, if we achieve that, then yeah, Hydra Falls will, will be, I think, popular. Since they are kind of effective means to change lift force at high speeds. Using just regular hull with small fins or rudder is kind of more difficult. So maybe for some landing applications, so again, we're considering applications, again, for military. So if they're still interested to move things fast in shallow water. Have you considered flexible trailing edges to the hydrofoils? Flexible tra trailing edge? Mm -hmm. so we did not look again specifically at flexible trailing edge, so our entire hydrofoil was kind of flexible. Right. I, I think if you consider um, mm -hmm. flexible trailing edges, you'll find that you can create a hydrofoil that will automatically change its camber with speed, um, because the the loads on the on the trailing edge are not strongly affected by angle of attack, but they are strongly affected by speed. So you can get a, a hydrofoil that will adapt itself to different speeds, uh, being highly cambered at takeoff and then flattening out for the high speed portion. Okay, so my dad will use your idea in one of my proposals. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a check if, if I get. <laughs> well, I, I can, I can, uh, I, I can I send you some some uh, re results and and uh, and analysis approaches. The um, uh, one of the things that we we did was uh, uh, we looked at at sort of the inverse problem, which actually makes things much easier. If you if you start with the deflected shape that you want to achieve then uh, you can then uh, basically get all the fluid forces that are acting on that deflected shape and then take them away and let the structure relax and you'll know, calculate the jig shape that, you, that will then result in the desired shape once you apply the loads. And, and uh, you don't have to go through the whole coupled um, calculation of structures and, and shape when you uh, go the inverse direction. Okay, yeah. Did you do those kinds of things, Tom, in your designing for America's Cup? We did. We experimented with uh, flexible trailing edges and we found that they worked, but unfortunately we ended up not using them because of uh, some other aspects having to do with, with uh, the range of motion when we deployed the, the foils. Um, uh, and for, so for example, uh, if the foil was highly cambered, then we needed to rake it forward more to get to zero lift when we, uh, when we plunged into the water to start attack. And, and that was more than the range of motion we had available. Um, so anyway, we, we found that the concept did in fact work, but but didn't use it. Thanks. Another comment? Yes, Martin. Unmute? Mm -hmm. You're muted. You're muted, Martin. I thought I'd, right, I thought I'd hit the unmute. Um, Constantine, I noticed with your CFD simulations, it's almost as if they're um, predicting sort of spray coming up from the foil, particularly that animation of uh, the foil going through waves. Um, the reason why I ask that is uh, some years ago, I realised that spray drag, at least according to some uh, um, some papers that are out there in the li literature, can equate to a quite a large drag component on surface piercing hydrofoils. And I've always been keen to come to terms with that, but do you think it's actually possible for CFD codes these days to reasonably predict what the heck the, the spray drag component is? 
Oh, it's more difficult since, yeah, you really have, when you have some kind of foamy flow, yeah, it's difficult. But again, if you make your numerical mesh very fine, so then probably you can do at least roughly, you can approximate the spray, at least how far it will go, what's the momentum it carries. But again, computationally, it may become very expensive. If you want to resolve yeah. droplets or bubbles, again, the gravitation phenomena. If you're not looking at developed gravitation, but just onset of gravitation, bubbly gravitation, and it's kind of difficult to do with CFD in low cost manner. So either you have to generate very fine mesh where you can resolve everything, since in principle it takes into account surface tensions. So yeah. That's not a problem, but yeah, it's just very fine scale, so it's difficult, just expensive. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Do you really need to calculate all of that though to get the spray drag? I, I mean, once you get the, the the momentum flux of the water going into the spray, do you really care about what happens after that? I guess it depends how it interacts with solid body, like with the foil, or sometimes the sprays also heat the hull. Oh yeah, okay. In that case, I can see of the boat. Yeah. yeah, spray drag is yeah very important at high speeds. So that's yeah it may become kind of dominant drag in some cases. With planing boats, especially spray drag is huge. If you could keep it away from the hull, you'd be in good shape. Anything else? Maybe uh, Galen. You asked a question that we caught a bit late to uh, uh, Tom Spears' presentation on the subject of safety um, developments that will be could be applied. If you wanted to ask that again, you could. Yeah, so I was just curious uh, uh, if you could speak a little more to the advancements in the safety measures with the newer AC boats. Uh, all I see is ski helmets and exoskeletons. Yeah, okay, so uh, so yeah, we started wearing helmets and uh, the sailors also uh, wear air bottles that give them um, uh, just a few minutes of air if they're trapped underwater. Um, uh, so that just a, it's just a small bottle kind of right behind their back um, with, a, with a scuba type uh, mouthpiece um uh and then the uh, uh the you know their their flotation vest and so forth act sort of as body armor uh because you know when carbon fiber breaks you can get a lot of very sharp shards um trying to think some of the other safety aspects they also they also train <laughs> by uh, by jumping off of olympic high dive boards uh, because, you know, when you have a, a, a boat that's 30 feet wide and it's capsized, you are 30 feet in the air. And, and you're going to be making a long fall down to the water, perhaps. Um, so th there are a number of things like that that they did in order to both train the crews and improve their equipment. Tom, I think I read as well that, uh, that the crews on the uh, F-50, certainly the Sail GP, they all carry knives these days to cut free of any entanglation, if at all possible. Heck, I do that on my own trimaran. I, I have a knife on my, uh, I carry on my uh, PFD. Um, and I can tell you from experience that when you're underneath a capsized multi-hull, uh, all of these lines are hanging down and you're looking out from under the cockpit, and it looks like a whole forest that you've got to negotiate as you're uh, as you're going out. No, that's interesting. Well, I, I wanted to make that diversion, but are there more comments or questions for Constantine because he's really on the on the uh, podium? Anybody think of anything else in the meantime? Well, if not, we've just about used the hour. I think that we had. Uh, thank you very, very much, Constantine, for an excellent presentation, great information, and um, just much appreciated. And of course, you're accumulating views 
on YouTube as we speak. Um, oh, I have one real question for Constantine before you go. Is any of your software uh, available that you use for your computations? Sure. We just use commercial package Star CCM Plus. Star CCM. Okay. So it's now owned by Siemens. Right. Okay. But we are using academic license, which is relatively inexpensive. But yeah, if you want to okay. use it for profit, or for, you're not in academia, so it may cost you. An, yeah, I understand. Right. A car, luxury car. <laughs> okay. And then you need computers at about the same cost. Well, before we break up, let me mention that next week we're going to have um, sessions seven and eight of this series and the IHS 50th celebration. On Tuesday, we'll have Gustav Hasselskog of Candela presenting their electric hydrofoil. And Harry Larson will follow discussing active ride control systems for hydrofoils. And then on Thursday, um, a panel discussion, Richard Stead, Carl Weisskopf, and Elliot James talking about USN hydrofoil operations and preservation. Um, actually, a lot of wisdom has come out of, of the uh, years of operation of real hydrofoils. So it's an interesting uh, topic, and I hope you'll join us for that. So um, see you next week. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Constantine.